Um, so my presentation is open source is one, now what? Which uh, totally gets um, next to the presentation of uh, Maurice. Um, if you want to see the slides live, I've put them online. You go to nicorikke.au slash t dash dose. Um, they're available if you want to watch them on your mobile phone or whatever. Um, okay, so just setting the stage. Um, this uh, presentation is to be uh, released on a free license, um, personal opinions. But more importantly, um, where does this uh, come from? Um, over the last couple of years, I've shared multiple roles. I've uh, been involved in sort of a software startup. I'm originally an electrical engineer, now turned software engineer. And in that, I've seen uh, many roles uh, regarding free and open source software. And there's sort of a narrative I've seen build, in, 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 at least in my mind, for the last couple of years, which isn't being told. Um, to me, it's an obvious story, and uh, I'd like to address that. Um, um, well, so let's get on with it, right? Because uh, the open source innovation model, if I'd like to call it, um, has, has certainly won. We're all winners. Um, just to show it off a bit, well, Microsoft has claimed they love Linux now, so this is a totally win in uh, regards to the last uh, presentation. Um, they run it for about 20% um, on VMs, on Azure. Uh, they use it now for the networking as well, virtual networking. So, yeah, they've embraced it totally. Um, the Dell XPS laptop, developer edition with Ubuntu preloaded, has sold out. I was left uh, without one, unfortunately. Um, Ubuntu has become the most popular cloud OS. Qualcomm uh, is beginning to build a reference uh, in a software development kit for drones based upon uh, Ubuntu Snappy Core, because they think that's the best solution. Android market share is very familiar, 82%. Um, uh, uh, also a giant win for free and open source software. And um, it all even runs on airports. Oh, okay, there was one small computer still running Windows 3.0, uh, 3.1. Um, well, caused a bit of a mess recently, but other than that, they, they generally use uh, quite uh, some free and open source software. And VW, of course, is familiar with um, open source software. They use it a lot in their cars. Not entirely, though, um, which caused a bit of a, a drop in their market share due to the recent... Uh, uh, yeah, uh, really, yeah, scandal, say. But luckily, it, it sparked new free software. This is a project called Volkswagen. And what it does, it makes sure that if you put out your code, you put this in, it'll pass nicely through the continuous integration as a developer. Happy, happy. And uh, eventually, whatever you put in comes out. But um, your build is always passing. <laughs> Okay, so in the general sense, um, what do we do? Because open source has become so, 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 um, say, ubiquitous. Um, free and open source software and more is, is really interesting. Um, a lot of companies are adopting it. And as such, a lot of users, persons, organizations are all rushing in to adopt open source, whatever that may be. It's a very uh, easy speaking term. You hear it a lot even though not everybody might be entirely familiar with it. So before I put up my uh, statement about what we should do, I want to take just a step back. See, okay, we have this definition or statement called open source. What is it really? Well, there's the open source initiative definition, um, which is 10 points long. Um, which also addresses some, some organizational aspects, some things about licensing. It's maybe a bit all over the place, but either way, it's a, it's a definition. Um, and we have the famous um, FSFV, our uh, GNU definition, which um, is really about the four freedoms you get as a, as a user. Um, and of course, user can be a, a company, it uh, can be an organization, can be an individual, or whatever. Um, and this is very, very concise uh, about those four freedoms which uh, define uh, free and open source software. Then, um, less strict and more of a, a practical definition 
is a definition um, uh, Martin Fink recently gave in a, in a talk. Uh, this was uh, at LinuxCon Europe. Um, and I'll address some other aspects of his talk later in the presentation. Uh, but he said, well, open source is actually three things rather than a, a strict definition. It's about a development community, it's about a license, and it's about the set of contributions made to the project. You cannot have open source without either of the three. And of course, um, especially the contributions can come from the original uh, project uh, uh, creator, say. Um, so this is a, a, a totally different um, uh, yeah, definition. Um, and then he also states in, in, his, um, in his presentation that in order for open source to work, it has to be a community of people with various interests and um, uh, obviously a shared common goal working for the project to be successful. This is also about how you would approach uh, some of the things. And another definition, this is um, uh, from Facebook, he said, well, it's just good for the company. And he stated um, a, a couple of things about that. Um, let's see if I can switch this. Nothing breaks? OK, good. Now it's larger on my screen, so I can read it better. Um, about sharing uh, Facebook's code, that it accelerates innovation in the world, that it helps others move faster. And ultimately, Facebook isn't a software company. They do software, they use software, but they're about networking. They're about social networking. Um, they're not about software. Software, to them, is just a resource. And I'll get back to that later. Um, secondly, um, well, embracing open source means that Facebook just writes better software. Um, because people know, the developers know, that it'll be open. And their name is attached to it, or might be. So you better do it the right way from the beginning. And the third point it makes is that um, by having uh, code in the open, other people, other organizations can join in and they can share to the challenges. They can help solve those challenges um, yeah, uh, together, very collaboratively, as sort of a community. Um, and uh, in turn, it also says it helps to improve the quality of the company staff. And whether that's about bringing knowledge in, or bringing people in, um, for example, Red Hat, um, in, in my mind, is, is quite famous for that, um, for, for selecting persons which do a great job and then they hire them. They can still do the thing, same thing, but then with, with the proper uh, company backing them. Okay, just another definition, um, which is kind of the other way around. Uh, this is about Benjamin Marco Hill. He gave a great presentation in, at LibrePlanet 2013. Uh, I encourage everyone to watch this presentation. Um, it's an hour well spent. And he basically says that open source, as it's being advertised, is false advertisement. One of the, um, one of the slogans is, given enough eyeballs, all boxes are shallow. And opening up your code would nearly automatically result in other people coming in and fixing bugs. But that's sort of magical, right? You just open up, slap on a license, and voila you have an open source project and um, everybody will develop for free. It's like um, going to um, a candy shop, maybe. But it isn't like that. Um, if you look at, at um, free and open source uh, software projects, or even other projects in general, um, it might be that there are a couple uh, projects or numerous projects doing sort of the same thing. But and at one point, sort of the time is ripe, and one of the projects is at the, at the right place, and it gets adopted. For example, we've seen it recently with Docker. Um, there's a whole lot of buzz about Docker, uh, whereas actually the containerization and the technology has been around maybe for a decade, maybe longer. Uh, but now, maybe with the social aspect, I don't know, maybe they just did good marketing. But all of a sudden, that project got out. So saying that opening it up, um, instantly makes it a great open source project. It's just false advertisement. And he states that, um, which I find very valuable, that the actual benefits of uh, free and open source software are directly derived from the, the more principle based, really the freedom, what that gives you. And he comes up with, with six points, whereas the first is um, that it's resistant to anti features, which means that 
if you want to put something in um, which is sort of malicious to the users, and one of the recent examples, I think, is the um, Ubuntu. It's sort of, I think, 2010. Um, Ubuntu put in the Amazon search box in the scopes. And there was a lot of community pushback. And ultimately, Ubuntu, if I'm not mistaken, put it out of, uh, of their operating system um, because of that. Because otherwise, people could have forked the project and leave that out. But then Ubuntu would be left in the dark. So you have to, it's sort of a treacherous path. And in that sense, you cannot easily put in anti-features, features which aren't actually features. They're limiting in some sort. Um, the second and the third point are really about making failures cheap, and uh, it makes failures cheap and it makes success cheap. And we see this now with, with startups. You can easily take on free and open source software, build a minimal viable product, see if it goes. Because you didn't code much, you can just build sort of the the, the, the glue that sticks all this project together and create a, a final project, a product. Um, but if you have success, you can scale up tremendously because success is cheap as well. Um, you mostly don't have to worry about licensing. You can just scale up, especially now with cloud infrastructure. Um, when I log into to AWS, you also get the, opinion, the, the option now to, to host um, certain um, licensed um, images, which to me is a bit absurd because um, especially in scaling infrastructure, having a, a very uh, free licensed um, model is very uh, attuned to that, which can scale up uh, very, very decently. Um, also, you might be able to switch out parts, especially if, um, if, if, um, if it's based on, on some open standards, uh, say. Um, fourth, it resists central control, robustly independent, as it's not just about the end of features in the software, it's also about the organization behind it. If the organization is whatever reason uh, not doing anything um, you like, you can always uh, branch it off. Um, I think, as a matter of fact, this will happen within a couple of years with Telegram, I would imagine, uh, because they've opened up their applications, uh, GPL uh, v3 or v2, if I'm not mistaken. I think v2. But either way, um, there's sort of this Telegram service right in the middle. And as they opened up, they've seen a lot of adoption amongst uh, and, uh, all sorts of, of operating systems, um, mobile, non-mobile. Um, but one of the questions which keeps on coming up in the community is, well, we got this Telegram service in the middle. We got all these great clients. They work tremendously well, and they're very user-friendly. But, well, there's this proprietary um, communication service in the middle. We have to rip that out. Um, so in that sense, it resists central control. It's just something waiting to happen. A fifth, it can sometimes, sometimes, lead to massive collaboration. And of course, the Linux kernel is very uh, famous for this. Um, so many people joining in and developing. But it clearly says sometimes, because this is sort of rare. Um, if in other parts of his presentation, he talks about just so, much, so many um, important projects uh, just run by a couple of guys. Um, for example, we, as a, from the uh, Free Software Foundation Europe, um, we see that with, with the uh, GNU PG um, developer, there was recently um, some, some funding going on just to get some developers in. Because if, if you have a critical piece of infrastructure just run by, by one person, it's sort of uh, insane in some sense. Um, and, and lastly, he says, it gives users freedom. And this directly derives from these principle-based um, uh, benefits, right? It's f freedom gives freedom, ultimately, to the users. Another way of looking at this um, might be more about uh, uh, corporate. Um, this is about um, some of the content uh, produced by Simon Wardley. And um, he's been around for uh, the Ubuntu team, doing a strategic work there. And you might claim that he is responsible for the mass adoption uh, that Ubuntu has seen in the cloud, because they put into that uh, full on. Um, and he's really a strategist. So the way he looks at um, open source is totally different. 
it's not just about freedom, it, it is, but um, it's really about the speed of innovation we've seen. That's why the innovation model is so, um, so strong. And he talks about aggressive commoditization. This is one of the articles um, he put out, um, I think it was, or 2012. We are heading to a world where being open or uh, exploiting open isn't optional, like Maurice said in a previous talk. Um, and for many, it will become a question of to be open or just not to be, not to be at all. Because uh, what you see on the, on the right hand side, you see um, a map. And this is uh, what, what he's sort of famous for recently. He put out um, a book you can read. Uh, it's very interesting. And it's really about the, the strategy. What you see is a value chain from bottom to top. Um, and this is about a photo application. And on the top, you see the final, uh, say, front end um, service called Fortango, um, which is served to the user. But below that, there's all these components in the software which make up the final project. And this is especially what, when Facebook says, we're not a software company, we just use software to bring you a great visual interface for social networking. And um, the, on the, on the x-axis is the amount of evolution that has been going on, how much commoditization is there. And totally on the bottom is power, because electricity, well, we've, we've got that. Um, and then compute data centers, well, that's also, um, yeah, you can just put up some servers now. There's no problem, especially with, with giant cloud uh, developments now, uh, all the scalable infrastructure, it's tremendous. Um, CRM websites, well, it might be just um, somewhat newish. Um, and this is a sort of a common trend. The more you get higher up the value chain, um, mostly the, the less evolution has been going on. Partly because uh, there's just less companies using it. And as a company, let's see, peek at the snow, I'll stay with this slide. Um, as a company, or organization, or user, whatever, um, you're really interested in a final layer at the value chain. And whatever else is beneath there is just a means to an end. So if you can speed up the commoditization and help it develop, um, that is in your interest. And as a matter of fact, by opening up, you increase this speed of innovation. So you increase commoditization. And this is really a strategic play. If you consider iOS and Android, um, Apple was, if I'm not mistaken, uh, first to market. And they had a very rigid structure with um, an app store. All the apps were curated. And Android just um, blew them out of the water uh, by, um, by, by being very open about accepting applications um, and, and licensing their platform to other vendors, uh, other manufacturers. And so there, uh, by, by opening up this, this, this ecosystem, the development as a whole um, sped up to the point where now they have that 86 market share, 86% uh, market share. And what you see now is in another sense a strategic play, especially with Android, is that they're taking back some of the openness uh, because they've got the market. So why do they need anything to be open? So they're replacing some of the core apps, uh, they're putting in all the Google services, and there's a pushback from the EU uh, on that part, uh, it's also uh, interesting. Um, but it's a, a very strategic play. And if you look at that, then open source is just a weapon, as it says here. Um, the quote is that some of the most successful and rapidly growing companies in the world use and provide open source. However, make no mistakes, these efforts are not just random, as in lets us open source everything, even though we'd like that maybe, but appear directed with purpose and with the intention to change market. So this is really intentful. And if you put that in a, in a, a very nice diagram, you can say, well, the level of strategic play and uh, how much you use openness really determines what kind of organization or user you are. Are you really a player, very strategic? Or are you just a believer, open source everything? Are you a thinker? Well, we'll see. Um, and, and sort of, um, this is, I th I, yeah, really the world nowadays. Um, 
Um, Sam Raleigh also states that especially the Web 2.0 companies, they see openness um, and, and even software developers as a whole uh, as a really strategic play. They use it um, intentful. So um, let's just see uh, what is today's world like, right? Um, well, I think the new norm um, of, of software uh, product as, as a whole today is that there's tremendous low barrier to entry. You can just download the app, right? You can see it on television as well. Just download the app and maybe there's some, uh, somewhere you get to a barrier where you have to pay or make an account. But mostly you don't have to because everything is integrated. You can just, it, it's easier to install an application than to find out how it works sometimes. Um, it's very easy to start. Um, and this, this uh, goes far further than just applications on, on uh, mobile phones, for example. Um, the experience are very personalized. Um, I think, for example, uh, things as, as Netflix um, uh, shine with this, um, in the sense that you get, um, you like certain things, well, we suggest other things you might like as well. Maybe things you didn't know you'd like, um, but it's very personalized. Um, and it brings it closer to the eventual uh, user. There's also a social component nowadays, um, especially with social media, um, but it, it, yeah, it, it, uh, it's also important in, in today's uh, world. And uh, more on the back end, uh, we see a lot of scalable technology and scalable businesses uh, associated with it which um, start off mostly, in, especially in, say, the, the typical Silicon Valley startup style. We start off with a, a project we think is fun. Uh, we make sure that we can scale up if needed, um, but we'll see about that. And if it takes off, then we'll scale up as well uh, with it, just uh, in the same pace. And also multi-platform, because we can't just say, well, we all got our desktop. No, it's also on a mobile phone, it's also on a tablet, it's also somewhere in the cloud, and everything needs to be in sync and readily available. Um, so this is, I think, somewhat of the, the new norms, and I might be missing a couple of points, I might be overstating a couple of points, but as a general sense, this should be it. But what I see in practice, and maybe I'm looking a bit grim at this, I see a lock-in in, uh, in all these products. I see very curated ecosystems, um, and this is not just from users, say uh, the, 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 the Apple guy who got all the i products, but also um, the, the Microsoft developer who can now go full stack with one language from devices to the, the desktop into the cloud um, to, to the, the front end. You can do that with, with, the, with all with just one uh, within one ecosystem. So even not just users, but even powerful developers are now put into sort of a curated ecosystem. And in a sense, then the freedoms we have and, and used to love um, are disarmed. Uh, also because if you look again at the picture of the value chain and all those components uh, stacking up to make a final project, um, if all those things are actually open source and there's a lot of community about that, Eventually, still, the, the final thin layer is sort of a gatekeeper to the actual freedom uh, we've come to love. Um, and, and this is exactly what I want to address with the next point about the, the open core with a shim of proprietary code. Um, also, a quite of, uh, a sense of, of planned obsolescence. I recently, in, in research for this, find an article um, that maybe Apple was slowing down intentionally, but this is hypothetical, so it's not sure, but slowing down after a new uh, iOS release or a new Apple product release, they were slowing down uh, the, the speed of the phones to encourage people to switch to the next best thing, to the next, the newest. This, this is really planned obsolescence. Also, the firmware you get with, with now your car, firmware with your house, if we get an Internet of Things, how long will that last? How many guarantees will you have? So there's a, and also we need to think about that. Um, a lot of services are being integrated, um, but might not be for the better. 
and uh, sometimes we're just selling out on, on customers. Um, especially when I, when I look at the new Windows 10 release, um, I find it kind of frightening that we're just used as guinea pigs in some sense. Uh, all the new software is being put out to regular consumers. Uh, it's being tested there. Well, I thought last week something went wrong, so they put it back. Um, but also at the cost of privacy implications, where so much monitoring is going on. Um, and as a, as a user, um, you're sort of powerless. And um, I think also uh, there's a, a, a sort of a throttling going on um, about the open development effort. If you see, and relating back again to the Android uh, project, um, if you have a lot of developers going on and you can push out a lot of code and, and make it so that uh, there's a lot of adoption, ultimately you can just remove many of the developments, uh, developers, or maybe branch that off in a separate project um, and just leave the development effort um, yeah, in, in the dark, say. So you can then uh, play with that strategically. So if that's not bad enough, it might be getting worse. Um, this is a book I recently read. Uh, I've bring it, uh, brought it along, so if you're um, interested, please drop by. Um, a Digitale Proletariat from Ad Verbrugge. And he makes the, um, the reference that um, more or less the communist view where we have um, the workers and, and the guys um, owning the machines. This might also be uh, in, in the new age, uh, where he says the industrialization of labor, and I've translated this by myself, was, uh, has made way for the industrialization of the mind. Physical exhaustion has made way for mental exhaustion and environmental pollution has made way for mental pollution. So in a sense, it's not just the industrialization as we come to know it uh, from way back, um, where it's only about the, the, the environment and the, the, the state of the, of the worker. But now it's becoming our personal lives and our minds, uh, which are at play. And reading everything that's going on, this book makes you quite grim, a uh, grim picture of the world. Um, so if this is to become true and uh, as bad as it is in this is philosoph philosophical book, um, well, we're going to get, uh, get some of a headache, I guess. Um, more, um, more widely, um, I think there's a many uh, viewpoints to look at free software. Um, I've come to experience a couple of them uh, myself. Um, I experienced another couple um, in discussion with people. Um, and each um, of, those, um, of those views uh, come with different, uh, different aspects. So as a, as a user, uh, free software brings, of course, freedom, brings some kind of independence. Maybe a reduced cost because I don't have to pay for licenses if I don't want to. Um, and mostly uh, some interoperability. Uh, a lot of open standards, uh, projects, uh, products work well with each other generally because we have all these uh, wonderful distributions. Um, but then again, as a, as a developer and sort of on the other side, um, um, there's a lot of example code available. I do that almost daily. Um, just, I'm not sure how to do this. Just look it up on GitHub, or whatever. See, how, how did other people solve this problem? problem? and you can just see it in the source code. It's readily available. It's great. And also you can use those software projects as building blocks to create some kind of solution you want. And it's also a showcase of skill, especially if you have these, these um, uh, repos or um, whatever, um, and you can show your work in this way, rather than having it locked down by some company. Um, and it, it helps show off what you're actually doing. More of the strategic kind, um, uh, free and open source software brings interdependence. A lot of um, um, you, uh, not just dependence or independence, but rather interdependence. Because, as a um, regarding a strategist, uh, we might be a strategist as a, as a user even, um, but from a, an organizational point of view and a, a company, um, if we share common goals, 
uh, as companies or as organizations, we might be working together. And if we are interdependent, well, I can just go off do my own thing if I want to. I'm not dependent on anything, but uh, as long as we're still happy friends, we can work together. Um, of course, quoted so many times, but um, not really the issue at stake, I think, is the uh, reduced cost of a free and open source software. Um, and more importantly, the innovation speed. And again, relating to the interdependence, this is shared development effort. And more of the, the, the architect, um, you see a lot of standards, um, right? Um, very mature components, which has been iterated on many times. Uh, the code is open, so it's not just security by obscurity, but rather we have well-proven tested security. It's very mature. And it, it might be even very innovative uh, projects I can, I can use. So a lot of projects to work with. Um, for politicians, and I've been um, uh, talking to them uh, to some of them, uh, quite a number of occasions. Um, mostly it's about reduced costs. Well, we got this um, four year plan or the new, um, 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 how do you say that? Well, whatever, um, each year you have to make up the budgets. Um, if you can reduce costs, that's good, right? Then you just score points. But rather, I'd say it's about independence. And also, very importantly, about the market. Um, it's maybe a, a very liberal view, but if you have an, an, um, a very open, um, um, open source based, um, free and open source based uh, software uh, ecosystem, it's very healthy and competitive market. And as such, it might boost your local economy. Um, you see this also in developing countries where this actually helps because you don't have to ship it out to other countries where the real developers are there and it gets um, um, handed off by the big corporations in other countries, but rather you can use the developers who are in your own country. Um, and in that sense I find it enlightening that, um, I think it was last week, we, a couple of weeks ago we saw the, uh, the FUD about uh, Gembo, no it's about um, Pink Rocade and uh, Centric, uh, they uh, provide software to municipalities in the Netherlands and they have a sort of a duopoly and they got in the news with that um, and that a lot of muni municipalities are basically locked in to um, somewhat, um, uh, well, yeah, frustrating contracts, let's put it that way. Um, and now um, uh, three municipalities, um, uh, amongst of which is, is Eindhoven, where we are here today, uh, they've come into a, co a collaboration and what they're doing is they're putting out one, uh, they're instructing one uh, software developing uh, company, uh, Gembox in this case, uh, to build software for them. So they, as a collaborative uh, of, of mun in municipalities, they own the software. So they have a very strategic uh, play there. They have become the owners of the, of the software and um, I'm not sure what their licensing model is or going to be. Um, but they're taking matters in their own hands because they don't want to be as dependent as uh, is now the current state. And well, a more of an activist view is that in general, because we have free software, our freedoms are respected. And we also have a freedom to defend. Uh, because if we have these resources now, we have, we have an ecosystem, we have a community, it's something to worth coming up for. Uh, as Maurice also put out in his, uh, in this talk before, um, and now we have something, we have open encryption, everybody can use it. So we have uh, something to say, well, we need to defend this, rather than, wouldn't it be great if this was open? No, it is already open, it is already free, so let's defend it, rather than just creating it. And so, I think, we might be thinking about our own ecosystem. Um, just to strengthen uh, our community, uh, free and open source software. So what did that, how does that look like, uh, such an, an ecosystem? Um, when you consider our domain, um, I think it's sort of, um, um, say, a very, a very blurry dot. Um, I, I could, didn't bother to, to draw the actual picture, but if you would imagine uh, the, the, the free and open source software uh, world as a, as a sort of a dot, 
then a circle. In the middle, we have the things which are really good, right? We have the, the kernel, we have web, uh, and the whole the web stacks, server applications, and associated uh, development tools, which very good condition generally. Um, more on the outskirts, um, we have desktop applications, mobile platforms, social services, and media formats, because um, this may be a bit so-and-so, it depends. Some projects are very good, uh, some get um, um, a bit um, held back by uh, patent issues, by copyright issues, um, interoperability aspects, or because there's not uh, as much interest to, uh, to development. Um, and at the outside, uh, we really have the ugly things. Um, and I think especially firmware and DRM are uh, the points to, to state in this regard. Um, because, um, yeah, this is really a struggle, um, getting this fixed. And again, if, if you are to be in the, um, in the, uh, in the hall um, uh, today or tomorrow, you can see the struggle uh, Libreboot and Coreboot are having just to uh, get some free firmware on devices. And as a matter of fact, there's also uh, a laws uh, being made. I thought it was only in the US, but I just heard uh, it might be in, in Europe as well, about restricting um, a firmware being uh, deployed on, on, say, routers and uh, other firmware, because it might interfere with the radio spectrum. Well, that's true, but is it a valid enough reason? I don't know. Um, so it's, it's a very difficult um, uh, state. So if we want to come up with our own ecosystem, well, where do we want to head? What should be your goals? Well, um, I have an opinion about that. So um, one of the things I want to get sort of get rid of, uh, firstly, is, is copyleft. Um, there's a, I, I don't think it will be as much in this audience, but um, uh, I've heard that amongst developers. Well, I don't use copyleft, um, or I, I don't really understand it. I don't want to use it. It's complex. Um, I think this definition um, uh, Richard Stallman put out in the GNU manifesto really says it all. He says GNU is not in the public domain. Everybody will be permitted to modify and redistribute GNU, but, not the, but no distributor will be allowed to restrict the further reduce, redistribution. That is to say, proprietary modifications will not be allowed. That's just the consequence of having uh, freedom, uh, say, persist. And because I want to make sure that all uh, versions of GNU remain free. So this is the ultimate goal. And it might be for GNU, but it might be uh, broader. It's about keeping those freedoms alive. There's a very, um, of course, there's a whole legal uh, debate of how, what's in the license. But as a general point, I think this is something worth um, uh, going for. Um, but more recently, these are two, um, uh, two statements about two, uh, two guys high up. Uh, one is Shane uh, Kukuru, he's a uh, vice president of Apache Foundation, he's also working for IBM. And the other is uh, Martin Fink, he's a CTO at HP. And um, they recently gave uh, this year a presentation, both of them uh, individually. And both of their statements are true. Um, it's just that I think they have different views. Because Shane says, well, um, as, as a uh, vice president of the Apache Foundation, well, we don't need copyleft in today's world, right? Um, the open source uh, innovation model has won. Uh, we know about open source licensing. It has become ubiquitous. Um, we don't need it, copyleft. We can just do it, everything permissive. And the freedom to choose a license and a business model are more important, very in individual freedoms. I just want to do whatever I like. Uh, I want to relicense or license my project, wh whatever I want to, regardless of what everybody before me uh, put into it. And he says, well, the longevity of uh, the projects we have is really in the foundations. We have uh, foundations, organizations, and uh, those are to be, uh, those will have to take care that eventually uh, the projects uh, get some longevity. The other point of view is from Martin Fink, uh, who says, well, um, he makes a statement about uh, pro uh, copyleft, and that is that copyleft reduces uh, the benefit of forking. The sort of it, this is the argument I made from his story. Um, it reduces the benefit of forking, 
and thus drives collaboration. If you have organizations working together on a project, which is copyleft, um, then if you were to fork off and, and uh, um, do your own thing, you'd have to give that back, those contributions. So this, is, this incentivizes um, a forking off, which you wouldn't have in a more per permissive license, right? This is, either way, this is valid. Um, and uh, thus, um, if you have a sort of a, f a more forced collaboration amongst organizations or users, you need less organizational requirements because people are sort of forced to work together. Um, or if they don't, they can still do their own project, but it might be that the original project is taking some of the contributions back into it. And thus, if we get this collaboration, well, this will eventually uh, be beneficial to the uh, long-term health of the community. Because it's better to work together than everybody working alone and just sharing the dead code rather than having lively conversations about what you're actually doing. And uh, just to summarize, I think it ultimately comes down to if you see the freedoms of the individual uh, alleviated bo above the team as such, a team is a very general collaborative uh, definition. Or if you see the uh, freedoms of the team as being more important than the individual. Well, I think for the ecosystem of free and open source software to thrive, we need collaboration and we need the team to come out as a winner rather than the individual. So I'd go for the statement about from Martin Fink. But both statements are, are true, are, are valid at least. Um, it's a, a really personal opinion, I guess, uh, how you see the world. So how would we persist freedom? Um, there's so many ways of doing this, um, even not even touching copyleft if you, if you want to. But you can just promote freedom, right? Uh, do that a lot, we have a stand. Um, we can promote standards to um, um, uh, and make sure that uh, we have standards to develop on if we need to. Uh, we can create adoption of free and open source projects, right? If it is a very adopted project, well, that's, that's good. Um, we can have, like, um, um, like Shane Kukura uh, puts it, we can have foundations, or organizations, to help um, keep this alive. Maybe even stronger would be a copy left, and you might even consider, and um, it might be a, uh, uh, a bit of a bold statement, you might have some kind of lock-in because if you look at other ecosystems, um, they have very closed borders. Um, um, I think I, I just recently uh, started using GNU Social um, on load average as a platform which is providing a sort of similar service as, as Twitter is. And it used to be that there was an integration service where you could write messages on one of the, or one of the two and it would spread out on the other network as well. But Twitter put an end to that because they don't want users as much to um, uh, get into other networks. It's not in their interest. We, you might argue that if you have freedom, why would you want to have no, lesser freedom or non-freedom? And whether you would organize something over with, um, with, with data formats or with uh, networks. Um, this is really hypothetical, but this was just in my mind, well, you, you might even um, make this a reality. I think this is ultimately a, sort of a bad idea, but, well, it, it, should be an, uh, it could be an option. Um, one thing I wanted to highlight, and that's why I put it um, on, on the right-hand side, this is when I opened my F-Droid store on my Android mobile phone. Uh, I hardly use the Play Store nowadays. Uh, this is less advertisement. It's uh, better curated. You get instant, uh, inside information on the license details. You can view the source code. It's really good. Download F-Droid now. Um, and, but if you look at Firefox in, in the F-Droid uh, uh, application store, you get the, the notice that this app promotes non-free add-ons because they have their own add-on uh, distribution, which can uh, allow for non-free add-ons. This app tracks and reports your activity. Um, I think it's optional, but I'm not sure. And this upstream uh, source code is not entirely free. There's also some binary blobs, apparently. So this is really putting out the warning, well, this is a, a, a free and open source software project, but there's a couple of things you might want to watch out for. 
I think we could also do this the other way around and say, well, um, this is Firefox, they have these b downsides, but on the other hand, they're also a giant organization um, and they're using uh, that organization to build uh, open web standards, right? It might be a green definition there. Um, but okay, this, uh, just, uh, this is just the way it is. I think this is a, a yeah, great example. Um, leaving the, 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 the freedom discussion, um, uh, I think it's also important to, to have some uh, resources in our uh, ecosystem and just see what, what about funding, right? Um, <coughs> uh, one of the things Ma Benjamin Marco Hill already put out is that there's sort of a freedom-driven subsidy. All the people who really love freedom, they want to see those free software projects succeed. So regardless whether it, the project is as viable, they might join in just to see it, get it uh, up to speed. There's sort of a, 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 a subsidy. You get that for free. That's, that's really the magical thing if you choose especially a very uh, free software license. Um, you get sort of a subsidy, that happens. Um, but rather, um, uh, we get uh, donations, maybe have a model with the associated business, uh, which is doing some development uh, effort as well, but just opening up the code. There are various models of doing that. Um, and, and more recently, we've got the option of, of crowdfunding. And on the right-hand side, I put a, an image of um, uh, snowdrift.coop. Uh, it's a great project. Um, there's a couple of presentations uh, online uh, about that. I encourage everybody to watch or join the mailing list. Because what this ultimately is, is um, a very collaborative social uh, funding model. So what it does is, um, it's sort of the snow, um, um, snow scooping um, issue. Well, I have a street. If I just remove the snow from my doorstep, well, still, the, 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 we can't drive the street. Well, we need to gather up all the people and say, well, if you do it, I do it. And if you do it, then we'll, I do it too. So we get a, a sort of a shared commitment. And eventually, we all join in and clear the road. And especially what they do with this funding, because um, the more people have joined in, um, the stronger your uh, addition will be. So if you, um, in, in this case, there's, um, uh, this is uh, just a mock-up, but there's uh, 684 um, uh, uh, pledges, uh, people putting pledges out for the project. So if this is a, a large set, if you put in another pledge, all those people who are already in, they say, wow, more people coming in, and they put out more money, just a tiny fraction, but nonetheless. So it's a reinforcing uh, funding model. Um, it's very interesting. I, I hope this uh, will uh, succeed. There's a lot of uh, organizational backing for this. Um, so in that sense, it, it makes it, um, making it social. Um, just, uh, just yet, one of the friends uh, came by and said, well, I, I've got this um, FSF pin. I got the golden one because I've paid um, $50 for it. Not just the regular price, but this is, a, this is a special one because I can show off to other people, well, I support it. I truly do. Um, this is really about making it social, and this helps funding. Um, and uh, also, of course, if very uh, business-like, we can uh, diversify uh, certain sources of, of funding. And maybe uh, we should uh, avoid sort of a, a, a negative scalability, avoid a total dependence. Say, if funding stops, uh, we can at least scale down the operations to a, to a level where it's acceptable, rather than burning through. Um, then um, about the, the, the strength of uh, the organizations, well, we have some uh, needs for that as well. Um, whether it's a, um, a very diversity of interest, um, at least we have to set a common goal as an organization where everybody's heading. That's really the, the role of the organization. And also some guidelines how to do that. And of course, there's also humans involved in uh, development and maybe uh, yeah uh, massage that a bit if, if needed right that's what uh, I think an, an organization is about uh, we recently saw something with with Ubuntu project which I think was a little nasty in some cases um, uh, but they've they've uh, came out of that um, but yeah just to showcase uh, what, what it can do and also, um, like we, we used to do, um, and really about, the, the, say, the code and the final uh, product, we have to uh, build it uh, better still. 
So this is what we come to expect in today's world, right? Eye pleasuring, uh, eye candy, whatever you want to call it. Um, some marketing associated with it, a good documentation, and make it very easy to install and deploy. Because uh, on the right hand side you see this is a freedom box, which is actually live. Uh, you can, um, I recommend the, the, the recent presentation from at the Software Freedom Law Center, and uh, it's, it gives a demo. And I intend to put one up in this weekend on the Raspberry Pi. Um, but you can deploy on cloud with one click. It's put in a default folder, you don't have to think about it, it's just that easy. Uh, it's really because it's targeted to consumers rather than just uh, sysadmins. And provide the batteries included, right? Uh, certain features, that's a commonplace. But in this ecosystem we can also do things with uh, free and open source services and, and even content. There's so many free content available, we can, we can use that. And regarding services, for example, if you look at uh, GPodder, it's uh, and, and just a, a, a discoverability of a podcast, but they also have a sync service. It doesn't cost much bandwidth, but it's uh, a service, right? So, um, how to get there? Well, I can give a list of recommendations. Um, one of them has been in the Cathedral and the Bazaar, very long list. Um, is it a good idea? I don't know. I think I still have a proposal um, uh, about how I think we should be getting there um, as a sort of a common set of values. Um, I just named them. Um, supporting software freedom, um, building on each other's work, ensuring interoperability, getting low barriers for adoption and contribution, a diversity and continuity, uh, continuity of uh, resources and a, a, a large uh, community representation of a product lead. Uh, so this is really um, sort of the summary of how I think we should be getting there. But then again, this is just a start. This is my list. This is what I could be able to come, come up with after the summer when I think about this uh, mostly. Um, but I think other people might have opinions on this too. So I'm happy for everybody to join in on this discussion. And it ultimately comes down to an attitude. Um, so, um, um, we have to ultimately remain conscious. We have to be conscious of what's going around, of our environment, what impact we have as, as an ecosystem, as a community. And I think we also have to be questioning, questioning the project lead, questioning the business model associated with it, if there is any. It might be a funding, uh, as a broader definition. Or questioning uh, even the license. Right? Stay sharp in that sense. Um, but again, start questioning your own actions. Um, I should be doing that as well, I think. Um, uh, uh, and because we're all inhabitants of a free software community. And in that sense, um, it's oh, again freedom. Um, because I think that it's ultimately the freedom that enables our ecosystem. Uh, that's why we're all here, that's why it's branched off, that's what Maurice also showed. And it's that freedom that fuels our economy, uh, community, sorry, uh, it might be the economy as well. Um, and this freedom drives this innovation model we call open source. Uh, so that's what I wanted to say, um, if there are any questions please do, um, uh, although I'm running a bit out of time I see. So thank you all for your attention. And, uh, yeah.